So, all right. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. We're going to do the working of the Safrad Hood. Yesterday, we did the intro to Hood, which it can be found on our YouTube channel. And today we're gonna to do the working. So we have Mercury and the cartouche and the keyword of splendor. I put this here as a reminder to you. This should all look familiar. This is our roadmap. This is the path that we're taking. And we went over this in detail in the intro. There we go. So become aware of the four petal base at your root. In the name of Haramael, the archangel which resides over our egregore and the power of this symbol, we connect in to the group spirit of the egregore and extend our base to include our participants. May they be centered, clear, and present. On the exhale, extend your awareness through the pathways we have been cultivating over these many months. We've been working together. Down on the exhale to the center of the planet. And drawing up on the inhale, we bring the planet's energy to us. And again on the exhale, we extend out to the center of the sun so that we now encompass the solar system. And on the inhale, we draw down to root that in our being. Once you have established the sphere and scope of that visualization, take as many breaths as you need to do that. And look around. You are as large as the solar system. And the sun is in the east. Look to the sun and perform your Kabbalistic cross, inviting in your holy guardian angel. Perform the LBRP to clear your space on the astral plane. And be careful not to bump into one another. And around me flames the six-rayed star. Consider your intentions. What do you need from the hood? Is it clear communication that is authentic, direct, and kind? Is it vision into your own true potential to become aware of options? weigh their value, make good choices, and make them with confidence? Or is it awareness of your blockages, enhancing your objective capacity to perceive them rationally, balance them, and delineate reason from emotion, to recognize moments and experiences of rigidity and find adaptive responses to our challenges? What gifts do you want from Hood so that you can proceed along the path of the great work and in doing so, move our whole sphere of awareness, the whole solar system, 
and everything to continue towards its perfect potential of the skillful use of intellect. Now search around for a door. There is a door somewhere in that sphere, that vast sphere of the universe that leads you to Malkuth. May we be encompassed by the power of the name Shaddai El Hai and established in the place of Yasod, the foundation. May the portal of the 30th path be open to us and may we journey thereon in the power of Eloah Vida'at to the gate of the sphere of Hod, splendor, and in the name Elohim Sabaoth, may the gate of Hod be open to us. And may we be firmly established in the wonders of that sphere. Hearing in your hand the Egyptian cartouche, you enter the temple of Malkuth with the appropriate signs. Sandophon takes you quickly up the path of Tao to the temple of Yesod. In Yesod, you greet Gabriel and put on the violet sandals. The archangel leads you quickly up the path of Resh. You see yourself standing at the end of the orange path of Resh facing the door to the water temple of Hod. A large orange door is in front of you. Carved into this door is the letter He, painted in blue. You give the projection sign and step through the door into Hod. Once on the other side, you give the sign of silence. The temple is an eight-sided chamber, draped in curtains of orange silk. The floor is also colored orange. Embedded into the floor is a figure of an octagon constructed from fire opals. The scent of storax is in the air, and the orange ceiling is ornamented with a large blue sigil of the planet Mercury, in the center of which is the image of a cup. Eight marble columns surround the central blue altar on which is a disc of opal containing the sacred temple flame, a chalice of water, and a book with the figure of an octogram gracing its cover. On closer inspection, you see one word written on the book, knowledge. Elohim Almost immediately, a mighty and shining figure appears, a dark complected being in robes of orange ornamented with a blue octogram on his breast. He has an angular face, piercing eyes, and a robust sinewy frame. Thrown back from his shoulders are two enormous wings colored in orange and blue feathers. He carries a book tucked under his arm Mikael, Archangel of Hod, speaks to you. You have entered the realm 
of the absolute or perfect intelligence. By what symbol didst thou enter therein? By the symbol of the cartouche. The royal ring of Egypt contains a god's name. It is the receptacle for god names and words of power. It is a worthy symbol for the realm of the intellect and communication. You face the archangel across the light of the altar. He directs your attention to the temple flame burning brightly on a disc of opal. Then he opens the book of knowledge lying on the altar. The temple around you suddenly seems to become transparent. It fades from view and is replaced by cloud and mist. Gradually, you see before you what appears to be a dark and endless expanse of water. The vision is dim and murky, and, move, and the movement of the water seems like shadows shifting against other shadows. You hear Michael's voice above the roar of the sea. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. All things came into existence through God, and apart from God, not even one thing came into existence. What God caused to exist was life. And the life was the light of humanity. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. Above the image of the dark sea, you see a brilliant light, like an atomic explosion lighting up the night sky. The sound is deafening, and you almost feel the earth quaking beneath your feet from the impact. All you see now is the divine white brilliance, which slowly settles into a rocky landscape against a clear blue sky. On a hilltop above, you see a line of winged angels dressed in orange robes and holding staves. They are the Beni Elohim, the angel host of the Sphere of Hod. Each angel is surrounded by a halo of blue light. This sight takes your breath away. Respectively, you ask to know how the angels of Hod function in the eighth sphere. One angel steps forward to address you. It is Michael in his guise as the ruler of the Beni Elohim. In legend, we are the children of the gods who are attracted to the daughters of the men. We came from the heavens to mingle with humanity and teach humanity the arts and sciences. It's written that these Beni Elohim saw the children of humanity and they were fair, and they took them to be their consorts of all which they chose. The hidden meaning of this allegory points to our duty to interact with humanity on behalf of the divine. We impregnate the mind of humanity with knowledge and consciousness. We teach the arts of communication and magic. We are the thought forms of divine consciousness that are the immediate formers of human intelligence. We are the principles of God awareness within you. Before your eyes, Michael changes his form. He transforms into the figure of an old gray bearded Renaissance philosopher holding a lyre. <clears throat> the sight of his richly ornate apparel and broad-brimmed hat is mildly amusing. 
So he looks for all the world like an artist, Leonardo da Vinci. Mikhail explains. Code is the sphere of images that are created by divine beings. These images are controlled by the mind and the will. Meditation on these images will reveal sublime truths. These holy images include God forms, the personas and likenesses of gods, goddesses, heroes, and archetypes that are formulated in the intellect in the sphere of Hod. They are the forms and faces that the divine chooses to reveal itself to you, transforming itself in ways to help you understand. Mikael changes back to his original archangelic appearance. He holds out his hand, and as he does so, the cartouche symbol in your hand begins to vibrate and glow with light. Observing this strange phenomenon, you see hieroglyphics appearing in the center of the cartouche. The main symbol within the cartouche is that of an ibis. Mikael tells you of its importance. This is the name of Toth, Tehuti. This is the God form chosen by the divine to instruct you in the mysteries of Hod. Mikael, the line of angels and the hill they stood on all fade from your view in a swirl of orange mist. You find yourself standing in a vast room filled with books. It's obviously a library of some kind, and there seems to be all manners of books, both modern and ancient, lining the walls. There are hardcover books on the shelves, as well as papyri, which are kept in large clay jars. The concept of time seems irrelevant here. Egyptian scribes and simple linen kilts sit at long tables, writing on sheets of papyrus. Next to them sit medieval monks in plain brown frocks, painting ornate letters and large colorful manuscripts. On another table sits a man in a gray suit, working intently on a laptop computer. Sitting opposite him are two children speaking silently in American Sign Language. At the far end of the room is a large throne with a seated figure. The occupant of the throne is very familiar to you. The ibis-headed god seems like the very essence of serenity as he overlooks his library known as the House of Life. He wears the Atef crown, a tall headdress of double feathers resting on the horns of a ram. It is a fitting symbol of dominion for the god of science, writing, and magic. He who is the master of time, a god whose titles include the Lord of Holy Words, Lord of Heaven, and Toth three times very, very great. You humbly ask the god for some knowledge of the sphere of Hod. Toth answers. Humanity was made of life and light, transformed into soul and mind. The wickedness of the soul is ignorance. The virtue of the soul is knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is the gift of God, for all knowledge is incorporeal but uses the mind as an instrument as the mind uses the body. Toth passes the palm of his hand in front of your face from left to right. As he does so, the vision before you undulates like water that has been disturbed. The scene changes to a desert landscape. You now see the image of the great goddess Isis 
cradling the motionless body of a small child. Her sister, Nephthys, is weeping nearby. Both goddesses seem to be in a high state of distress. Scurrying away from the child is a black scorpion. The son of Isis has been stung and the deadly poison of the scorpion has rendered him unconscious. The lament of the goddess is painful to listen to. Stung is Horus, O Ray, stung is thy son. Stung is this beautiful child of God, the son of Unepha. Shall Horus live for his mother? I pray to the heaven that the boat of the sun stop in its journey across the sky until Horus is brought back to life. The cries of the two goddesses reach the heavens, and even the mighty sun god, Re, stops the solar boat dead in the sky. Then Toth, the trith great god, descends from the heavens to aid Isis in her sorrow. Toth appears provided with his magic and possessing words of power. He kneels over the lifeless body of the child. The god extends his hands over the dead Horus and intones a magical formula quiet, quietly in the Egyptian tongue. As he does so, you hear Mikael's voice repeat the following words. The speech in the silence, the words against the sun of night, the voice of Toth before the universe in the presence of the eternal gods, the formulas of knowledge, the wisdom of breath, the radix of vibration, the shaking of the invisible, the rolling asunder of the darkness. The becoming visible of matter, the piercing of the coils of the stooping dragon, the breaking forth of the light. All of these are in the knowledge of Toth. At the ending of the night, at the limits of the light, Toth stood before the unborn ones of time and then was formulated the universe. Then came forth the gods thereof, the aeons of the bornless beyond. Then was the voice vibrated. Then was the name declared. At the threshold of the entrance between the universe and the infinite, in the sign of the enterer, stood Toth, as before him were the aeons proclaimed. In the breath did he vibrate them, in the symbols did he record them. For betwixt the light and the darkness did he stand. Throughout the speech you see a golden light flickering around Toth's hands. The light spreads over the prone body of the young wounded god. Suddenly, the child takes a breath and opens his eyes. He calls out for his mother. Isis cries in delight and relief as her son Horus throws his arms around her. The goddess Nephthys praises Toth in heartfelt gratitude. Thou lordly Ibis, thou god, for whom yearneth Hermopolis, let me tell of thy mighty works in whatever land I be. So will the multitude of men say great things are they that Toth hath done. Suddenly, several images cross your mind. You see an elderly man sitting next to a dialysis machine which filters his blood and allows him to survive a chronic kidney disease. You see a young woman lying comfortably on an MRI table as her neck and back are magnetically scanned for injuries. 
you see people using sophisticated satellites and Doppler radar equipment to predict tornadoes and provide early storm warnings in order to save human lives. You see a myriad of inventions created over the years to improve the quality of human life. And you realize that all of these things are the result of the intellectual activities found in the Safra of Hode. Hoth appears before you and speaks. Knowledge used well with divine intent and ethical understanding can bring forth many wonders that aid humanity. However, knowledge used with an evil intent or without an ethical understanding can bring many man-made horrors and afflictions to humanity. Years ago, a priest named Nefer Kata desired to possess one of my most potent magical books for his own selfish pleasure. Through bribery, he discovered where I had hidden my book and through evil magic, he killed the sacred serpent which guarded it. For this sacrilege against me, Nefer Kata paid with his life. Yet the evil that accompanies the misuse of knowledge continues to this day. Once again, Toth passes the palm of his hand in front of you from left to right. As he does so, the vision before you quivers like an agitated pool of water. Several new images are presented to you. You see an entire rainforest cut down for fuel. You see several acres of mountain wilderness strip mined for coal. The land is completely devoid of life. You see a lake that is so polluted from industrial runoff that humans are advised to stay far away from it. You see a warplane raking a small village with cluster bombs that destroy everything in its path. You see guided missiles fired from a battleship to deliver their lethal payloads to a city hundreds of miles away. You see the innumerable ways in which humans have abused knowledge with devastating consequences to themselves and to the environment. And you realize that all of these things are the result of the abasement of Hoed energies. These terrible images fade from your view. And once again, you are standing in the House of Lie, the great library of books. The ibis headed god looks at you with inscrutable black eyes. He addresses you once again on the nature of the mind. Mind is the very substance of God. If indeed there is a substance of God and of what nature that substance is, God alone knows precisely. There are two gifts which God has bestowed upon man alone and no other mortal creature. These two are mind and speech. And the gift of mind and speech is equivalent to that of immortality. If humanity uses these two gifts rightly, they will differ in nothing from the immortals, or rather they will differ from them only in this, that they are embodied upon earth. And when they quit the body, speech and mind will be their gods. And by them, they will be brought into the troop of the gods and the souls that they have attained. Speech is an image of mind, and mind is an image of God. Use these gifts wisely. Gradually, the library and its inhabitants fade from your view. The image of the great God Toth lingers for a brief moment, then too vanishes in a flash of light. You find yourself in the Temple of Hode once again, 
standing in front of the altar across from Mikael. Like your two previous Sephardic experiences, the visions that were shown to you have occurred within the Temple of Hod. You never left the sanctuary. Mikael, Archangel of Tehud, and leader of the Beni Elohim, gives you a few moments to get your bearings. Then he closes the Book of Knowledge, lying on the altar. You thank the Archangel for his glimpse in, of the mysteries of Hod. Quickly, you descend the orange path of Resh from Hod to Yesod, where you briefly anoint yourself with oil and return the astral slippers. Descending the path of Tao, you find yourself in the temple of Malkuth, in the company of Sandalfon, turning to face the portal through which you first entered the temple, you give the projection sign and pass through. On the other side, you give the sign of silence. <laughs>